The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Hello, my name's James Wrigley. I'm a financial advisor and one of the principals of Melbourne-based financial planning firm, First Financial. I've been a long-term listener and contributor to the Ensemble Group and podcast, picking up some amazing nuggets of gold over the years. And through this podcast and the people that I'm able to speak to and interview, hopefully I can continue to deliver some of those nuggets of gold to you. This podcast series is brought to you by leading Australian life insurer, TAL. TAL is committed to partnering with advisors to protect the financial well-being of their clients now and into the future. TAL's accelerated protection products ensure your clients have access to cover options that are suited to their individual needs. Last financial year, TAL paid $2.7 billion in claims to nearly 40,000 customers. Thanks. So welcome back. Uh, I'm James Wrigley. I don't know how to intro these podcasts. I've got to work on how I do that. So anyway, I'm I'm James. I've got two for the browser. One today, Chris Bates and Craig Bigelow joined me today for the podcast. Uh, thanks, guys, for joining me. Um, Craig, I reached out to you, but we've got the two of you, which is even better. So thanks for joining me. No worries. Pleasure, CB mate. and CB2, CB1 and CB2. <laughs> <laughs> Chris and Craig. So that's it. Um, so Craig, we'll maybe start start with you and I guess we'll get you both to intro yourselves. I'm, I'm sure lots of members of the Ensemble uh, community are probably aware of the two of you, seeing that you know your faces pop up on LinkedIn or Instagram or wherever else it might be, podcasts in the past. But, but Craig, maybe if we start with you, can you give us a bit of your background and where you're at, what you're up to at the moment? Yeah, so I, I guess it's um it's changed a lot in the last <laughs> six weeks. So um, <laughs> it was almost twenty years in in planning. Um, the last well, at least ten being primarily risk. Um, and um, last year I merged merged businesses with VR, and then um, late last year it was sort of just working out where I was at, and I guess I'd been a bit worn down by where risk risk was at and um, I guess my role in that space and I had a bit had to do a bit of thinking around what do I want to do for the next 10 years and um, do I see myself doing the same thing and I, I sort of sat on it for a, a while. I, um, Chris is helping us buy, buy a house at the moment personally and I had conversations with him and a few others and just had a couple of months to think about it as well um and i just couldn't get over that answer of i can't see myself doing the risk for another 10 years <laughs> and so um mm-hmm. as much as it was challenging I, I knew that i had to make a make a bit of a change and um the offer from chris was was pretty unique and amazing and um yeah like it took the opportunity and jumped into something completely different um, with a bit of personal hesitation as well, considering how much of my life was tied up to risk and I felt my identity was in risk. So, a little bit of a challenging one there for me personally as well. So, you were in Melbourne for a while. Like I, we caught up years yeah. ago, one of the yeah. cafes in the city. So, you were living in Melbourne for a while. You've moved back to Sydney now? Yeah. yeah my wife works um, for Seafolly. So, we moved back up to Sydney um, for that. And so, we've been yes. back here for a little bit, but um, we're, we're looking to buy back in Melbourne at the moment um, and hopefully get back down yeah, right. um, uh, when we can. But at the moment, we're, uh, we're up in Sydney. So, it's um, a bit yeah. of a transient. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and Chris, how about how about you? I'm sure anyone that's catching this podcast is probably well aware of who you are and what you're up to. But can you give us the bit of rundown on your story? Oh, it's been um, obviously I got out of planning about three years ago. I like gave the license back to um, Madison, and um, yeah, we've just sort of grown the mortgage broking business. And you know, it's been a great journey. It's a real something we've really fallen in love with. Um, and, um, yeah, it's a real passion. We've got a bit of a team going now. And on the personal side, it's double dad in the um, trenches, as they say, you know, a three and one year old. And, um, yeah, zero to nine a.m. Well, four a.m. four or five a.m. to nine a.m. It's it's full on, and then nine till four, it's full on in the business, and then it's back to it. So, um, yeah, no, things that things are good. Living up on the beaches, all the teams remote, so it's it's a pretty amazing. The shift in COVID, it's been amazing for the broking industry. I think it's been good for the advice industry as well in terms of digitalization mm. and et cetera. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's, things are good. Yeah. Yeah. And so how big's the team 
now? Because it, it was just yourself in the beginning, wasn't it? It was just myself, the solopreneur, yeah. the, the starting it out, ignorant, arrogant, thinking I knew what the world was doing, um, trying to do two different things at once and um, didn't know who I wanted to work with, etc. cetera. Um, uh, so about four, it'll be four and a half years ago, Ben um, joined. He was an ex paraplanner. He ran a paraplanning outsourced business um, through Malaysia and had like 20 staff there. Um, he and I were friends for over a decade now, but about six or seven years at that point. Um, and uh, so he joined, then his brother joined, um, and then we've got nine overseas um, at the moment. So then we've got um, a few extra people in Sydney, Melbourne, and Craig joined. Another guy starts next week. Um, so totaling up now, we'll be getting close to well, 17, I think, um, That's in the huge. team. Um, but it's a funny model. Like a lot of bro, I um, 2020, 2021 was a year of just significant growth. We went from, you know, low 100 millions to over 300 million. Um, and, you know, we're up to probably selling about a billion dollars this month. So as a broker, that's, that's quite a, you know, big number. Um, but most brokers are done on an individual basis. Ours has been a team effort. Um, mm. and everyone basically works on every client. Like, you know, we do someone to control it a little bit, but, um, at different stages, but it's, um, yeah, it's, it's awesome. It's rather than a lot of broking models are just sort of silos, you know, one broker and one support. And it's, it's not a great efficient model because not everyone's playing to their key skill set, I guess. Um, yeah, good. So yeah, it's, um, things are good. Yeah. Yeah. And Craig, maybe have a bit more chat about your experience in the in the risk space because I know like you you've done a whole lot of work in automating like renewals and all of this stuff. Like you know we, we've spoken previously about about the tech side of trying to make yep. that a bit of a, a smoother process. Can you maybe touch on what you what you built there? And and I'm interested in how you you know you've decided risks not for for you going forward. Yeah, I think at the end of the day, um, that's a passion for me. It's just like making things as efficient as they can be. And, and that was what I spent a lot of time doing. But when I, when I sold my business, I worked out, yeah, I got a, a, a decent amount of, um, like, money for that when I sold but um, what I got paid because of the automation probably would have been the same if I had a just written business the whole way through <laughs> so um, it was always a bit of a thing you, you take your eye off the ball of new business to focus on the efficiencies and essentially end up in the same spot but one thing that I take away from it is that if I hadn't have done that I wouldn't then be able to have the knowledge to apply to something else and yep. so I guess this presents a new challenge for me to replicate that same thinking to something else that um, is another new challenge for me. And it's a good opportunity, as Chris said, given where they've come from to now, it's been an amazing growth journey. And I'm just trying to bring some of that thinking that I had previously to this new role and I guess take us into the future in a way that we can all work together and deliver on what we promise to more people, I guess. And that's really yeah. the challenge. And it's an exciting one for me because there's a lot of opportunity in there. And I think it's a chance to do it really well together, if that makes sense, rather than um, leaving what I'd learned before. Yeah, okay, the widget's different being lending versus risk, but the commitment to doing it as efficiently as possible to put clients at the center and deliver the best experience we possibly can is exactly the same. Hmm. So what so what so what's your role? What is your role? Is it what's it, you know, going to morph into? Do you, like what is it that you're doing within the business? So um to pretend that I'm an expert mortgage broker is completely <laughs> completely untrue. Um I guess the the challenge would be if you were to go out and put your hat up and say that you're a mortgage broker from day one, I think it doesn't sit comfortably with me. I've literally I've never bought a house personally. <laughs> I've never done a loan. Actually, I think I did one in early 2000s when I thought it was a good idea to get into it. But um, I guess the unique position of it is that Chris has asked me to do nothing I'm not comfortable doing. So, my role is to speak with potential partners and our partners and make that as tidy and efficient and clean as we can. Um, do the initial phone calls with people that are very similar to planning conversations, uncovering goals, uncovering needs, um, understanding what current and future plans are, um, gathering that information, exploring what things look like, not just for this current transaction, but into the future. Um, and then I provide that information to the strategy team and then they catch up with Chris to talk about property and um, strategy and how things for, from a banking policy, all the things that I don't know is not something that I have to have conversations with. So, as, as Chris mentioned, with the team approach, 
it's it's everybody doing the things that they're good at rather than trying to pretend they're something that they're, that they're not. And yeah. then we've got the you know the processing team and the <laughs> the engine room or the credit team that do all the applications and then everything from there on. It's everybody sticking to what they know. Yeah, and so it sounds like, and Chris, maybe I'll get you to to comment on it. It sounds like it's more than a what I would what I would anticipate of a normal broking relationship. You're not you know, going, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. ANZ is going to lend you the most amount of money. Off you go, and then, and then the client is left to their own devices as to well, what are they actually doing? What does the strategy look like? It, it sounds like it's more of a almost a financial planning mindset around the the lending that they're doing. Yeah. Can you talk us through what that looks like? I mean, it is. I mean, I guess my heart still as a planner, right? That's what I started as back in two thousand and seven. You know, that's I became a mortgage broker. I was doing mortgage broking, uh, planning meetings with mortgage brokers. And so it's hard for me to switch that hat off. And I think that was why it was hard for me to give up the license, even though I was so in love with the, the property conversation and guiding people on it. I, you know, cause it was my identity. Um, now I just stick to my lane. I'm right. We, we work with advisors. I, I, I was losing, I was not having the conversations around the other needs like I should, um, cause I didn't have the relationships and I also had the license. And so it was a real, enable of us just to let go and um but i still the mindset still has to be there with with debt debt advice and and property advice you know it's a big un- underserved need um and so we're definitely not facilitators or validators and and you know i happened to a client yesterday he came in and he's like i'm trying to buy some you know some cheaper lower end properties um he lives up in newcastle and then I'm going to do these duplex townhouses on them and sell them and make money. And it just won't work. And, you know, um, and he was quite, you know, stubborn in trying to say that he just wanted me to facilitate the loan. And we, the conversation ended because I said, we just won't facilitate and validate. Like, if you want to come on board with us, you need to be able to, under, you know, listen to what we've learned. Um, and so, absolutely, it's it's a financial planning mindset in terms of helping people think through, you know, if we buy this apartment, what's going to happen after that in five years' time when you, you're telling me you want kids or, you know, you, you're telling me that things at work are really unsteady and you're not sure what's going to happen. Well, let's let's take a step back. Let's let's figure out what – get that clarity, I guess. Um, and so um, the property side, we don't uh, act as property buyer's agents. That's a key sometimes misunderstanding. That is actually another amazing professional that you need, you know, like a planner, like a great broker. You actually need, um, not always, but it's usually likely that a great buyer's agent will add a lot of value to your situation if you can afford their fee. Um, and so what we do is we play as the middleman to them. We say, well, yeah, ultimately the best option for you right now is to upgrade in Sydney or to buy your first home in Melbourne or to buy an investment property in Brisbane or something. This is the best two or three buyers agents we'd recommend. Um, and we don't get paid for those referrals, but we know that they've been doing it five or 10 years. You know, we know they've got that local market knowledge and they've got the relationships with the agents. And so, um, absolutely. I mean, I was sitting down at a, I run little masterminds with, you know, top brokers. I always reach out to, you know, a top broker if I hear about them and have a chat and put a little group together. And I even asked them, you know, like these guys are doing well over a hundred million dollars a year. Um, and, you know, wh- wh- how do you guys feel about the property conversation? And everyone basically said, oh, you just got to stay in your own lane. You know, your role is there to just to provide the, the, the loan. And I just don't think that's good enough. I think that, you know, we need to educate. We've got, we're in an informed position. We need to give them information that's going to help them, you know, snowball, you know, make a great decision that will snowball into a better decision. Um, and so, and that, I, I mean, a few years ago, I did an XY, um, when it was XY, I did the, you know, the broking slash pl- uh, property, property course. Did, yeah. yep. um, and that was probably where my initial, my thinking was, I was like, I'm letting, and that was, that was when I was leaving planning. I, 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 I feel like I've got a real attachment. I want to help the planning industry um, with this conversation. And I wasn't sure how to do it. And so I thought I oh, will do a course with XY. Um, and over the years that, that, that desire has still been there. And, and prior to Craig joining, I, I was like, I think the really way that I want to help is work with planners, give better advice and build better businesses by really solving this problem. And we went to a business coach who specializes in this sort of connection. We were building out a whole plan and a strategy. And then fortuitously, Craig's telling me that maybe he wants to get out of advice. And I'm <laughs> like, well, you know, this is what we're doing. Um, we'd love to have you on board. So that's sort of... We were already on that path, but Craig was really the the missing ingredient that we needed um, to to really focus on that 
that onboarding, that nurturing, that education, the the real selling the the value of both worlds. You no, know, not just the assets, but the debts plus the property. And um, yeah, it's early days. We're still figuring out. This is not a um, you know, we're just looking for two partners. This is we're, we're trying to. This is a 10, 15, 20 year play for us. I've got a three year old and a one year old. We're not looking to do this till they finish school. So, um, you know, this is going to be slowly but surely just really try to help solve this problem and, you know, and, and encourage other brokers to come on board because, you know, there's a lot of planners and there's a lot of people who need help. We can't do it all as a business. So mm. it's, we're in that curious learning stage and um, building everything. Where did the whole education piece come from? Like, you know, you're, you're obviously running your own podcast and opportunity to speak to. Lots and lots and lots of people in, and you know, lots of really smart people around the place. But this whole, like, the idea of the, like, where did you build your foundation of knowledge from around, you know, what's a good property decision versus what's a bad property decision? Where, like, where did that originate from? Well, I mean, similar to Craig, what Craig was saying around, like, buying a property, I think it was like back in 2011. I'd say so four years in the UK as an advisor. One year I was working at AMP practice, and then. I was, you know, looking at jobs, right? Um, moved back only under a year experience in the Australian market. And just luckily, I got an offer from this Property Planning Australia, which was a financial planning business, a mortgage broking business. Um, and they didn't really do buyer's agency. They sort of said they did, but they referred it out. Um, and I was the planner and I was doing meetings with mortgage brokers. And the clients went from 60s, 70s, 80s, you know, that I'd done the last five years to, you know, 20s, 30s, 40s. And, I was doing the conversation around the risk, you know, around what are you guys doing with your super? Look, you know, do you want to put a long-term plan? And a lot of them said, no, we just want to buy a property. And I was watching the the mortgage broker have the conversation. I was like, this is just a really interesting chat and I really want to help younger people because it's the foundations of, you know, a lot of people in their 50, 60, it's sort of damage limitation, right? Like I, I want to retire at this stage and in my investment options. So I just, I fell in love with helping younger people. And then I, I slowly but surely, especially over those first two and a half years, I've, I just saw thousands of people that they had on their client book and what they'd done and what had worked, what hadn't worked. And I just started testing and researching and speaking to buyers agents. And it was a, it's been a snowball effect. I remember even early days in business, I don't know anywhere near as much as I do now. Um, and, and so it's probably been since 2012 to now. So we're looking 10, 11 years of just constantly thinking about this, learning, researching. Um, and then making my own decisions along the way as well. Yeah, gotcha. Yep. And Craig, maybe you can comment on where do where do your lending clients come from? Like where, where do they come from? Is it just they come from the, the podcast? Is it your website? Other financial advisors? Like where, where, what's the network look like? Where do the in, new inquiries come from? Yeah, I, I think as Chris mentioned, curious is probably the the mantra at the moment for me. So I, when I joined, I just went back through all of the intro calls for the last twelve months, and I just wanted to have a look at how it worked. Per, you know, selfishly, I wanted to know what to do on that call <laughs> um, from what was working for the others. Um, so really green in that space, and just trying to absorb as much as I could. And there was, you know, and Chris will pick me up on this if it's not right, but it, it seems like the podcast, LinkedIn, um, referral partners, being planners and those sorts of things as well the, are the majority there. Um, I, I think there's a couple of other opportunities that are in the the midst that Chris might like to touch on as well. But I think some of that stuff, you're looking at those traditional referral partners and then also coming back from clients. So, the, the team does a follow-up call after a loan settles with every client and one of the things they talk to them about is their experience and what whether they'd be comfortable speaking to other people about it and I would say that you know those emails get shared with the whole team and it's and Chris pointed out how good that email is to read um, there's for two reasons one we know very clearly what's not working so yesterday we had example that they said they were a bit confused and wanted a timeline of what happens at each step so I just move it from there into a project and that's a project on my list to work on as a timeline for clients at each stage and so we get feedback constantly on those things of ways to make those small improvements all the time. Um, I was saying to Chris yesterday, my project list is about 24 at the moment. <laughs> but but I think that's a good thing is that we're able to then prioritize those. They're not lost and they're not 
not all being done, but they're they're on the 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 board, right? To to look at. Um, so then the questions asked is is would they feel comfortable referring? And I would say, Chris, would I be wrong in saying that nine out of ten would be comfortable? Not saying that they do. Um, saying they're comfortable to do it on the phone and and sending their friend is a different thing, but it is a big yeah. source of that as well. Yeah, but I'm, I'm sure your process is strong enough, and the experience is 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 good enough that a fair few of them probably do you know, refer their friends yeah. or family, whatever it is. I think it's that experience that you were talking about too. Um, I experienced it personally as a customer. Um, I didn't really know what to expect um, out of the whole thing, but um, we sent Chris six properties that um, we were looking at that our buyer's advocate had suggested <laughs> and Chris said no to all but two of them. <laughs> and and I thought that was a really unique um, offering. I didn't expect that at all, but I think that level of, experience when you come in there expecting like you were sort of saying that facilitation of a loan and you get all of this <laughs> it becomes a very different proposition that that it, it's hard not to talk about yeah but that, that's interesting chris that you you know you rejected four of the six can, <laughs> can you comment on on i mean i need to know the address of the house that you're looking at buying in melbourne but <laughs> But like, what, well, like what is it about yeah. them that you know you rejected some and said these yeah. ones are, are decent like what what is it um, it's pretty easy to tell. I don't really know what those were at that time or whatever it is, but you know, there's usually a thought, there's a process, right? And it's going through the fundamentals. So straight away, I'll, I'll jump on the map and I'll see, you know, what the street is, right? Um, I'll usually know the suburb because you see the address and, you know, every suburb's probably got good properties within it, you know, within reason. Um, it's usually the street is a deal breaker. You know, great streets don't turn over that often. So it's very hard to buy on the best streets because people in them know that the best street. So usually the streets are deal breaker. Could be a busy road, could be a rat run. Um, and you can figure those things out pretty quickly. Um, could be the aspect is the next thing, you know, like it could be in Melbourne, Craig's trying to buy it south facing in Melbourne. And that's facing the rear of the property where you spend most of your time. You want that to be facing north, not south. And, okay. um, just, it's a much different proposition to live in in the winters in Melbourne. And, um, and so a lot of that, I, I think that's a bit of a deal breaker for a lot of property. Um, privacy can be a problem. I mean, one Craig was looking at there's an apartment block over the back. And yeah, there was some bamboo <laughs> shading it, but, um, you know, ultimately it's a privacy is a such a, it's a key thing. You either, when you're in a property that's super private versus a property where you've got someone looking over your back fence or, that that's it so privacy is a big one um the floor plan even just the front ever in melbourne for example everyone loves the beautiful frontage right yeah. and you know it's just that quintessential thing when you're doing well financially you want a beautiful looking sh- streetscape so important um yep. and uh not every property has those heritage features um even just the layout or the size of the block you know if you're looking in a city in melbourne a lot of blocks are too small like too small where you to upgrade it to a three or four bed, it just gets not enough living spaces. Um, you know, you could have uh, – they're probably a big one. Distance from transport, you know, there's black spots in suburbs where you uh. can always be, you know, 1.5 k's from the train or the tram and, you know, um, too far away from the cafe culture um, where, you know, ultimately people in that suburb, if they had money, they wouldn't want to be in that pocket. They'd want to be in this pocket. So you see that pocket – disconnects the stuff where everyone really wants to be and where um so yeah it's just going through that process the ideal like you know craig's pursuing one at the moment this will be sold after this podcast um yeah. but it ticks all the boxes great suburb north facing rear surrounded by other houses that aren't going to um create issues with privacy long term um beautiful frontage great floor plan great easy to renovate and add value to um and so it's just trying to tick as many boxes and just some things are deal breakers where you should just really hold off um and in, sometimes you haven't got the choice in a real hot boom market because by waiting you're actually actually making it even harder to buy those good assets because they're running on you and your mm. budget's limited. So sometimes you have to bite the bullet and go a seven or a six out of ten is good enough. But in this type of market, you hold off. Um, we had a client buy this week uh, and we always have a, we have a WhatsApp group and I was, you know, so-and-so bought and I was like, God, that must have been two years. So I just had a curiosity. I went out to look at our first email and it was two years to, to tomorrow. <laughs> so mm. it was actually one year, 364 days. Yeah. So I was wrong. Um, yeah. But yeah, he fine. He was so patient, um, and he bought in Mossman in Sydney. But he just bought an absolute cracker at the end of it, you know. Yep. Um, and so patience and persistence pays off. Um, and so that's what we we sort of encourage. 
I'll, I'll just just to add to that, I think it only highlights that Chris's planning brain never switches off, if that makes sense. And I'm not saying that the buyer's advocate sent the wrong properties, but what I'm saying is that Chris knew me personally and knew Carly and what we were looking for as a family potentially better, if that makes sense, because of A, for us, we got that personal relationship, but that's not unique to me. It's kind of the way that you operate, Chris, in terms of understanding deeply what people yep. are looking to do so that you can comment to some of those things that might have been overlooked by something that came through as a good property, but it's not a necessarily a good property for Carly and I, if that makes sense, based on what yep. Chris knew. And I think that's a, I don't think that can be undersold as well from the knowledge that you get from people, given that curious brain that you have that can, I think comes from a planning background. And, and and those points that you mentioned about privacy and the and the good streets and all the rest of it would would that would that type of approach be any different if it was a home to live in versus an investment or would you would you still be looking for those exact same things? Exactly the same because ultimately the price of the property is really based on who wants to own it um, and not on who wants to rent it, right? And you know because when you ultimately sell it, the, the market's driven by owner occupiers seventy percent, but some marketplaces and the marketplaces you really want to buy and are probably eighty or ninety percent driven by people want to buy there and go into a lot of debt and take on a lot of debt because ultimately offers amazing lifestyle to their family and it gives them, you know, whether it's access to the city for work or the schools or the the, the culture and the lifestyle around that and the beach and the water and et cetera. So the, the, the more boxes you can tick from a high-income family owner occupy market, um, that's ultimately what you want to be buying from an investment or a home. Um, and um, I think just the home is just your biggest opportunity, um, you know, and I think this is what I guess why the planning space – I think it's a, a probably our next evolution of the planning space is can can look at both sides of the balance sheet. You know, go look. Um, okay, what's all your assets? Okay, let's look at your super. Let's all look at your shares, etc. But let's look at your home. Like, what are you, is that a good asset? What are you going to do long term? You're going to live there long term. You know, it's a tax free asset. You know, we look mm. at the super changes this week. You know, um, it, it, what can we optimize that? You know, how do we optimize that? And you know, and I think that's something that we really you know, spend a lot of time on, um, you know, and if they are got other investment properties, like are those investment properties really working for you? Like a lot of people will just say, I don't want to sell that. You never sell those sort of all these myths around property. Yeah. But, you know, is it better to take that debt and pay off the home and then read debt cycle into some shares? Or is it better to look at an investment property, et cetera? Um, you know, if a client comes to us trying to buy a property in self managed super funds, they'll be like, no, <laughs> no, <laughs> we just don't do it. Um, and so it's it's probably just looking at the assets, but then also the debt. I think, Ignorantly and, and arrogantly, I thought mortgage broking would be pretty easy, like coming from a planning background, but there's so much to it. And even just restructuring loans and extending loan terms and, you know, maximizing interest only and using offset accounts wisely and, um, and then releasing equity and building buffers regularly. And I think there's a real value add in just as part of a planning process is every year reviewing that debt structure and optimizing it. Um, and even particularly more because the loyalty tax has gone next level in the last few years. It's just crazy. It's just easy wins for planners, I think, is going there, saving the client some money because it can happen really fast. And then there's that value exchange and the planner comes across as the hero because ultimately they're the ones who made the referral. Um, and so this is sort of what we're building out bit by bit. <laughs> I guess, Chris, uh, James, just with this, I guess one of the things that's just talking to lots of planners and asking what that, you know, most of them know, you know, if you've been doing planning for a while, you've got a network of people that you like to work with. So it could be the brokers, the accountants, the lawyers, those sorts of things. And I've just been really curious to know what does it look like? What's working? What do you think could be mm. there? And just really just trying to understand what it is that is there. Um, there's some really good relationships yeah. that are there and I've learned a lot from just asking questions. And one of those was capturing the review date for your planning clients as brokers. So, um, why why don't we know for those referred clients what the review date is so we can provide you with a loan schedule ahead of time, a rates card to compare what it is mm. with what's in the market, the script that I know you spoke to about the Macquarie Bank, um, you know, the link that you went through and all the stuff. I, I even yeah. saw your video on the revaluation that you had to do to get your home LVR attributed correctly. Yeah. All, how do you take that stuff into your meeting ahead of time? We've got all that data, but we're not using it. 
I'm not a crazy rocket scientist, but I'm, I like listening and I'm, I'm curious and I just want to try and take those things and make it as easy as possible for all of us to yeah. make that experience for the client as good as it possibly can and make the person referring us look like a hero that they, they already are, but just improve that from that visibility perspective as well. Yeah, fantastic. And maybe the last couple of things that I'll get you both to to comment on. I you know, can't can't have you on and not not get an opinion on you know the property market and direction. And Chris, you you often you know you'll put up a, a lengthy post yeah. on on LinkedIn whenever you've whenever you've you know, whether you've had a conversation with a client or something and, and give us your view. But you know, we're getting it all the time, certainly with younger clients. You know, what's going on with my mortgages? Should I be fixing? Should I go variable? How much longer is it going to go up? And I know no one really knows, but but can I get your two cents on the whole on the whole topic and and versus you know the the property market is it going to keep falling do you think we're due for a turnaround yeah is it pent up demand for, for on the buy side so maybe it's not going to fall too much further what do you think I think it's it's the the property market's a big um, name it's like the equity mm. market right and you, you know unless you're buying the index that's you know you're buying individual companies and and the property market works more like individual companies right it's individual properties that have all got different. Um, balance sheets and all got different demand and supply metrics, right? And I think that the planners need to shift from that because the media reports on the property market, right? They don't report and it, and properties actually individually, you own one property on one street on one side of the street, and that's a mini market in itself. And so I think that's just a I always have to kind of make that um, you know context. Um, so because there's many markets that have got really poor fundamentals from a supply point of view. You think about high density apartments, right? They keep building more of them. There's a lot of them. And then the demand's really patchy, right? It's a lot of it's investors and um, singles and couples and it's not the family market and then there's building issues, et cetera. So every market's behaving differently and um, and adjusting to, to higher rates. Um, that means that ultimately at the moment, it's, it's a story of where rates stay and, and uh, finish and where they stay and how long they stay at certain levels. Um, I mean, yesterday we had the ex- um, Chief Economist at ANZ for 10 odd years. Warren Hogan came on the podcast, right? I think he was quite insightful in terms of what he was saying. He was the one who was calling RBA rate at 4.5% last year when no one else was. Um, but I mean, even his view is that, you know, we've got a, a, a lot of tightening still to go, maybe even up to 4.3% or something. But then whatever comes on in terms of interest rates from here will likely have to come back um, once they get the genie back in the bottle, right? And so um, what's ultimately happening is the market's freezing up. CoreLogic yesterday, it's the start of March now, um, released um, list, new listings numbers in, in February. There was nothing. Uh, if you open up your portals, you'll see what came on. Nothing good came on because everyone in a good property right now is saying, why would I sell to upgrade when rates are high and I don't know what rates are and I've got a great property? Um, I even don't want to do a reno. We had a client pull out of a reno yesterday. Just that fear of unknown, people just sit still. So you're seeing this real um, contraction of listings and any property on the market has been is usually not a great asset. All those things we spoke about before. So very little supply and, and properties priced on the marginal buyer. So or any asset is really. And so, you know, if there's 10 properties for sale and there's 12 people who want to buy them, then, and those 12 people are really hungry and have got good budgets, then property holds its value. It's only when you see this flood of listings and a real drop in buyers that um, you start to get this fire sale event. And so a lot of the premium markets right now, very tight listings and buyers have already done their readjustment. You know, they've, last year was that freak out event, you know, August, September, October. Everyone thought rates were probably going to go up slowly and then they went up fast and everyone was like, oh, I don't know what's going to happen. And there was still a bit of stock on the market then because people had either bought or would, had done the effort to, you know, get it ready for sale. That was amazing buying. August, September, October. By the time November came around, listings got dry in December. Um, really, and so it's actually been, it was actually the best buying was back then. And, and no one would really say that. But if you go back in time, that's when we saw the clients get the best deals. Um, now there's actually more competition for the amount of properties on the market. Um, we're finding. And so there's support in the market and you're actually having to go into some type of competition to buy usually. So that's that's and that's all the properties our clients will buy. We don't go and buy in, in areas that have got supply fundamental problems. You know they've got demand problems. It's where you know there is really tight supply at all times, um, and there's a growing demand from people who ultimately have a lifestyle need. That pent up demand you spoke about, James, in our in in Sydney and Melbourne is significant. People who aren't in houses that they want to live in as their forever home. You know there's a lack of those. 
Um, and there's a lot of people wanting to upgrade into them that have missed out 2022, 2021, or maybe they just had a baby in the last couple of years and now they're ready to, to, to get into that house. Um, so yeah, I think there's a media story, but we've already started to see that, you know, there is a bit of support in the market. I think we could have a bit of a second wave of a downturn though. This is the thing that Chris Joy is talking about at the moment. And, um, is that there could be another freak out event if, if RBA rate goes past 4%. Yeah. I think if it stays at, if it stays under 4%, and the market's already factored that in. But if it goes to 4.25, that's a mindset shift over that four. And I think that would be also a drop in demand and people would want to wait till there's a plateau in rates or fall in rates. And so I think that could be another buying opportunity, but nothing's guaranteed, right? Like we don't know if rates are going to go that high or whatever, but that could be another little correction in prices. But if, if rates stops going up now, I think the best buying's already gone. Yeah, and gotcha. so um, it's it's a it's a rate conversation. It was only two months ago the um, market pricing was. I know this is a long answer. It's a big question. Um, <laughs> the market pricing was say around three point six for the RBA. Um, so that's sh- that's what shifted. The Australian government has realised that the Australian economy is quite resilient, and not everyone's got a mortgage, and people are still spending, and people are still moving here from you know overseas, and you know students, etc. And we're still going at too fast of a knot that these interest rates aren't biting, especially with the fixed rates um, problem that we we created in in COVID by fixing all our loans. And Ooh. so, um, watch this space, James. Um, but it's it just get individual markets, individual properties. If you want to know what's happening, get on the ground, go to an auction, ideally as similar as property to yours as you can, and call the agent and go to the open homes. See what's happening, you know, and see, and you might be surprised. Actually, you know what? That actually sold. That's not what domain. That's not what, you know, the the new media is telling what, me. That's what they're not going to tell me on the news tonight that this property sold for a decent price. In my suburb that was actually the same as mine. Why am yeah. I, you know, watching the news freaking out when I just saw that sold yeah. six buyers on one property that and there's no other properties on the market? Like I, so. You know, Craig, you mentioned it, you know, gone through the exercise with Macquarie about, uh, about the refinance and Chris are kind of doing some of what I've seen you writing about before, stretch the mortgage out, reduce the repayments down, yeah. release some equity, build the buffers, that kind of thing. And yeah. and, I'm, and I'm going through that process at the moment and I have no intention to use this money that I'm releasing, but yeah, awesome. I can. Where the valuation came through from from the valuer from the bank and the mortgage broker sent me an email saying, you know, guess what it was? It's, I had a particular guess and he came back with this price. I'm like, there's no way in the world that it's like, I couldn't believe how high this was given yeah. given the sentiment and what we're hearing in the news that it should be low, it's going down, it's gone down, it's gone down. And you're like, the hell this is, you know, it might have just been a, a fluke valuation from from the valuer, but- That sounds like a fluke, James. Happen. When you get those, um, <laughs> act. Um, yeah. And yeah. that's what we've done. Yeah. So, we're, <laughs> so that's I what we're doing. It happened to me last year, we got a place in Melbourne, and um, yeah, it's probably, you know, on a good day, one to 1.1. 1. 1, um yeah. And we got about 1.25. Um, yeah. Look, you know, the, the, it's an education here. You know, like it, what we did released equity, you know, that allows us to build buffers, that allows us to potentially spend money on renos, that allows us to, um, you know, buy other things, you know, other assets, et cetera. Um, you do need to be careful, though, with clients that are getting high vowels. It's, it's, there's an education process that you're potentially getting equity well over 80% and um, and that, you know, if, if you did you basically have a loan you know in that scenario james you may have a loan of up to 100 percent um at residential rates which is an amazing thing opportunity but it just comes with risk of knowing that yeah true if you ever had to sell and you, you'd use that money you might not have any money left over or go into negative equity etc yeah. but yeah the, the, those those freak valuations do happen um and they can create great opportunities for people to um, do other things you know um that they may not have been able to do if they had a low valuation for example mm. And I think yep. just on that point with um, when that sort of stuff comes up, I've seen it happen with a number of people is that Chris is like, well, you can't buy a quality asset with the equity that you've released. So, this would be the time to go back and speak to James about dollar cost averaging, these sorts of things that you should be having that conversation with him and potentially property is not the right investment for you right now with that extra money. And I, I, I've, I've really... 
appreciated seeing that conversation that's come backwards to say, look, yeah, you've got this. Don't go and get a property that gets us another loan that, you know, hooray, we're, we're, we're making money. It's like this is the wrong decision to be making for the principles that we use for you to buy your home. Go and chat to your advisor about this because this is where you could start to unlock some other opportunities and diversify your asset pool as well. So, it hmm. the practicing what he preaches on that one is – it draws me to Chris and I mean we've known each other for a long time personally um, but professionally it's only impressed me even more being on the ground and seeing it every day that it it really is genuine and I think that's a big thing that we both had over this journey it's that it didn't matter what we were doing we just try and tell the truth or our truth if that makes sense and not hold back on that one too and I think that's where we're, we're quite similar in that way in both sides of the coin <laughs> If I don't know something, I'll tell you. <laughs> if Chris knows something, he'll tell you. <laughs> um, so and I, I, I've always liked that about him. <laughs> um, look, guys, we might uh, wrap it up there. Thank you for, for joining me this morning. Um, for anyone that doesn't know where to find you and if they want to reach out, connect or whatever, where can they find you? You know, Give yourselves a bit of a plug. So we've got a new brand launching in a couple of weeks. So that it's going from Wealthful to Blusk. Um, and so it'll be blusk.com or .au. I don't know if we're doing .com or .au yet. That's one of our decisions. But um, <laughs> obviously we can chat, catch us both on LinkedIn, et cetera. I think that it's a big conversation for this. This is not something that, you know, in, in two years time we'll be doing something else. This is the, um, the, uh, something we're trying to really change at a, a big level, um, you know, and if you've got any relationships with brokers as a planner that's really working, like we don't definitely want to interrupt that relationship. But if you've got any like little tips on why it works so well for you as a planner, I would love to hear because, you know, we'd love to be including that in our offering and, our, and educating other planners to have that in their brokers and other brokers in the future. And so, um, this is a team effort. Um, I'm, I'm not someone who's in a scarce mindset or in a, it's a complete abundant mindset. And we, we're trying to get other brokers on this journey and other planners in it. And, um, yeah, and, and work as a real team, which should be happening when professionals, right? Um, but unfortunately, we all know that doesn't happen as much as it should. Um, and, uh, yeah, so, and thanks so much for having us on, James. And that's all right. Um, yeah. Thanks for joining me. Thanks, Craig. Appreciate it, mate. Thank you. Good to speak with you both. Catch, you, catch up with you separately another time I guess sounds good mate awesome <laughs> cheers <laughs>